Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise God. Amen. So we're going to get right into it. But um, before we do that, we're going to pray with our palms up. Amen. That God would speak to us and that we would be able to receive whatever it is that he has for us to, um, to receive this morning. Father, we thank you, Lord, once again for this, this day that you have uh, made. And we pray right now with our palms up, God, asking to receive whatever it is that you have for us this morning, Lord. We pray that our hearts will be open, that our hands would be open, that our ears would be open, that our eyes would be open, God, and that ultimately you would do what only you can, Lord. Um, pray that you have your way this morning, that you cause your word to come alive in us, Lord, and that we would take what we hear, God, and apply it, Lord, and apply it. And we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Praise God. So we're starting a new series today called um, A Promise and a Pattern for All Generations. And it's, it's um, based on the book of Daniel, right? It's based on the book of Daniel. And as E mentioned, as some of you guys may know, uh, we're doing a Daniel fast right now. And it's been exciting. But don't worry, the entire book of Daniel is not about fasting. So it's not a three-week series about fasting. Um, Daniel is one of the four major prophets. You guys know who the four major prophets are? This here, Bible scholars. Isaiah, Isaiah, Isaiah Daniel. Daniel. That's good, Chris. <laughs> Jeremiah <laughs> and Ezekiel. Okay. So Daniel is one of the four major prophets in the Old Testament, and um, and the book is named after. Uh, Daniel, the author and the main character in the story. And it takes place um, like almost six centuries before the birth of Jesus, right? Somewhere around like 597 BC, right? Before Jesus was born. And what happens is the people of Judah, right? The, the Israelites, the tribe of Judah were, um, they hardened their hearts toward God. And they were serving like false idols and things like that. And so basically God allowed them to be taken into captivity by the Babylonians, right? So the Babylonian army, they, they take uh, Judah into captivity. They take the people of God into captivity. And um, within the tribe of Judah is Daniel and a couple of his friends, right? And so that's, today we're going to look at three stories where Daniel and his friends basically had to face persecution and pressure while living in captivity, okay? So the title of today's sermon is actually called, it's called Defy, amen? It's called Defy, it's part one, book of Daniel, persecution, pressure, and perseverance, all right? So the story, we could break it up, uh, the whole book actually, you could break it up until about three parts or so. So it's about Daniel and his friends trying to maintain their faith while living in captivity, right? I don't know if anybody here can relate to that, trying to maintain your faith while living in a faithless world or environment, right? So that's a big theme in the story, but it also records the demise of two kings, two kings that were really proud, and then it documents their demise, right? And then finally, it documents or it records these visions and these dreams, that kings had and that Daniel had that tell of the future and the end times and ultimately of Jesus, okay? Remember, this is like 600 years prior to Jesus being born, but Jesus is in the book of Daniel. You understand? There's visions and there's dreams that take place, and we're going to get into all of that. Um, once again, a, th a theme could be uh, described as a pattern and a promise. The pattern is that when, uh, uh, when God's people persevere, he is with them. Okay? That's one pattern that you're going to find throughout the book of Daniel. When God's people persevere in the face of pressure and persecution, God is with them in that. The other thing that you're going to find in this book is that pride comes before the fall. Okay? That's the theme that you're going to see in Daniel, that pride inevitably leads to the fall. Okay? 
And then finally, we're going to see a promise, like I just mentioned, that God will, through his son Jesus, uh, bring an end to all kinds of evil, every kind of evil, and every kingdom, and every ounce of pride, even the kind that hides in our own hearts. Amen? That's the promise that we're going to find in the book of Daniel. Okay? So, again, we divided it into three parts. It's defy, dethrone, and defeat. Okay? So today is defy. Amen? All right, so let's get into it. So we're obviously we're in the book of Daniel, if you want to follow along. We're, I'm going to jump between uh, three stories. So the first story is in Daniel chapter 1. So Daniel and his friends were monotheistic Hebrews living and working in a polytheistic pagan society, right? Daniel and his friends believed in the one true living God, right? But they were, but they were living in a society that did not believe in their God. They did not share their faith or their values or even their morals, okay? Not only were they living in that society, but they were actually uh, living there against their own will. They were held captive, okay? And they were working in that because Daniel and his friends were chosen to work in the palace for the king. All right, so persecution for their faith and the pressure to conform were tremendous, all right? So I said, we're going to look at three stories, the book of Daniel, where they had to persevere under intense pressure, persecution, and how ultimately they um, defied kings, how Daniel and his friends defied kings. That's why it's called defied. Okay? How they defied kings. Let's go to the next slide. So Daniel chapter 1, verse 8, it says, but Daniel resolved not to defile himself. Daniel resolved not to defile himself. In the Amplified Version, it says, Daniel made up his mind. Right? Daniel was determined not to defile himself. All right? So, at this point, the Babylonian king, he had already changed the names of Daniel and his friends. Right? Amen. We got the... We got the baby's choir up in here, singing. We could worship. I get back on the drum. We could worship. Amen. Excuse me. So um, Daniel and his friends were, their names had been changed. All right, so they were taken from their home, right? That's foul. Um, taken from their families, everything they knew. Their names were changed. They, initially, they had Hebrew names that re reflected God, their God. They were given Babylonian names that reflected like these idols, okay? So they had to change their name. Imagine that. Their names were changed. And, uh, and now what was happening was the king, he would serve these, uh, these meals and, and to the people that worked in the palace. And Daniel and his friends worked in the palace. But guess what? The plate that was being served to them had food on it that, they, that went against their faith, that they were not supposed to eat. Okay, so now there's a conflict, another conflict that they're being faced with as the plate is being passed, right? And so Daniel, right, he, it says that he made up his mind, he resolved, and what's interesting about this verse is that after this verse, it says, and then he asked his official, his superior, that he would not defile himself in this way, you understand? But he had already determined, he had already resolved, he already made up his mind prior to even asking, all right? So now, you know, they're getting ready to serve this food to them, and Daniel is faced with a decision. He has to choose either between, he either has to defy or be defiled, right? He has to either defy the king, who is powerful, right? Or be defiled, amen, before God, who is all-powerful. You understand? So he was looking at authority figures and saying, okay, I'm, I'm under this authority, this Babylonian structure, and they're saying this is the way I'm supposed to do things, but I also, but I serve God, right? And so I have to make a decision right now, and I wonder how often are you guys faced with that same decision to defy or be defiled? I know I'm faced with that decision every day, to defy or be defiled. Amen. So when the plate is passed in your direction, 
right? Because it doesn't have to be just food. When the plate is passed in your direction and on the plate is pride, the pride of life and the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes, are we resolving to not be defiled? Are we determining, are we making up our minds to not be defiled, to defy that power, that pressure, that authority that is asking us to conform to things that are ungodly? Okay? So under extreme pressure, they had to choose either to defy or be defiled, and they chose to defy. defy. Daniel 1 eight says, but Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine, and he asked the chief official for permission not to defile himself in this way. And I love that verse because he determined it before he asked for permission. In other words, I know th this, is, this is how it's going to go down. But respectfully, I'm going to ask my superior. You know, it's like being on the job and they ask you, hey, I need you to do X, Y, Z. And you determine in your heart and in your mind, that's not, that's not going to rock because that goes, that's an infringement upon my faith. But even still, I'm going to go talk to my boss and say, hey, I can't, I can't do that. Amen. So this concept of defy or be defiled is one of the major themes in the book of Daniel. Okay, so we're going to look at another example. Let's go to the next slide. So here we see Daniel resolve not to defile himself. Now we're in Daniel chapter 3, verse 18. Okay, and here we have Daniel's friends. Okay, the verse says, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not, say we will not. We will not. We will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. Okay? Here we have Daniel's friends Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, which were pagan names given to them, as I said before. The actual names were Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, which reflected God. And now they have these names that reflect these, these idols and these, these pagan uh, gods. Okay? And now what happens is the king... King Nebuchadnezzar, he builds this statue, okay? He builds this huge statue of what? Guess what he, he built the statue of? Gold. Of gold, but of, of himself <laughs> in gold, right? As if he wasn't, you know, sufficient in, in, in of himself with all the power that he had already. They were already basically worshiping him. He said, now I'm going to build this huge statue in gold of myself and demand that the entire kingdom bows down to worship this idol whenever they play the music, okay? So here we see uh, these guys, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, defying, once again, just like Daniel in chapter 1, defying the king's order to bow down and worship a giant gold statue that was like a replication of himself, okay? Once again, we see they were under extreme pressure they're facing extreme persecution for their faith. The whole kingdom, everybody else is bowing down. It says that everybody bowed down when they played the music. But then these dudes, they saw that they weren't bowing and they went to the king and said, yo, you got these Hebrews that are here and they're not following your orders. You understand? Sometimes in this life, you're going to be that person that stands up when everybody else is bowing down. Or vice versa. You're going to be the person that's bowing with your palms up when no one else seems to be doing that. All right? And so these guys, again, facing the king himself, Nebuchadnezzar standing there, and they had a choice to defy or be defiled. And in the natural, it would have been much easier to be defiled. Right? Because all they had to do was bow. And in bowing, they blended in with everybody else. You see, when we bow at work, when we bow at home, when we bow in our communities, we don't stand out. We blend in with everybody else, and there's no problems. But when you stand up and you choose to defy things and kings and powers and pressures, and you choose to, to stand for your faith, then you gotta face situations like this, right? So just really, really quickly, quick context. Just prior to the Babylonian invasion, remember these guys, they've been taken in the Babylonian invasion, right? They were taken from their homes. Just prior to that, when they were free, when Daniel and his friends were free, they were free to serve God. But instead they chose to serve idols when they were free, 
Okay? Not necessarily Daniel himself, but the tribe of Judah. Okay? When they were free to serve God, they chose to serve idols instead. Now, because of that, God allowed them to be taken into captivity. You understand? The captivity was a consequence and a repercussion of their idolatry. You understand what I'm saying? You follow me? Okay. So they were serving false gods, and now they're in captivity. And guess what? Now they're in captivity, and they have to face the same temptation once again. It's as if God is trying to press the issue. You see what I'm saying? He's trying to press the issue. He's saying the reason you're here in the first place is because of idolatry. And now they're facing once again the issue of idolatry. Do we bow before God or do we bow before man, before this statue? Okay? So they have to choose once again. And to make it worse, they were threatened with being thrown into a furnace for defying the king. And they responded in this way. When the king said, hey, you either bow or... You're going to be thrown into the furnace. Okay? You either bow, you're going to be thrown into the furnace. And I need you guys to be creative in your thinking. Okay? Because although this is a literal story, the application of it is not literal for us. Right? But it is symbolic. Okay? In other words, someone may not say, hey, you either bow or get thrown into the furnace. But they will say those, that same message with different words. Mm-hmm. You understand? And we have to be aware of that. So he says, hey, you either bow or be thrown into the furnace. It's the king standing before them. It's the whole kingdom. They bow, but they watching to see what these Hebrews do, right? Yo, they're going to bow. They gonna, what's going to happen? Everybody's watching. And here's how they respond. They said, if we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it. And that, that, that could have been it right there. That's dope, That's right? right? They could have been like, peace. Drop the mic. He said, nah, I got some more for you, king. He said, and he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. And they ain't stopped there neither. They kept going. They said, but even if he does not, say, but even if he does not. But even if he does not. Because that's a whole entirely different sermon right there. But even if he does not. Get that in your spirit. They said, but even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. They say, no, I won't bow. And if you put us in that furnace, my God is able to save us and he will save us. But guess what? Even if he doesn't, we're still not going to bow. We're still going with God. You know, my father tells a story one time. He said, he said, if the plane is going down, airplane, you're on a plane, the plane is going down. He said, you cry out to Jesus. He said, only two things can happen. You either going to be saved or you're going to go into heaven crying out to Jesus. Amen. And what better way to go into heaven than crying out to Jesus is calling on the name of Jesus. And then you stand before him. Only two things are going to happen. You understand? Why do anything else? That's what they were saying. They were like, yo, we ain't bound. Either God's going to save us or he's going to take us. But we're going with God. But we got to really get that in our spirit. We got to really think on that and meditate on that. You understand? So once again, we see the perseverance of God's people in the face of pressure and persecution. Standing before the king and his obnoxious statue in the entire kingdom, they had to choose either to defy or be defiled. And they chose to? Defy. Okay, let's look at the final story. It's the third example. Okay, so we saw Daniel resolve, made up his mind, determined, purposed in his heart not to be defiled. We see Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego defying the king to his face, saying, hey, we're not going to bow. And then finally, let's go to the next slide. We see Daniel once again in chapter 6. Now, this is a different king. You see, Jesus said in this world, you will have trouble. You will have trials. Okay, so Daniel already, he got through the first situation. You know, he, I'm sure he got through a bunch more. Now, this, is, this might be two, maybe three kings later. This is King Darius. We were talking about King Nebuchadnezzar. Now, Daniel, see, Daniel was prospering, though. Do you see that? He's prospering so much, he's outliving king's reign. Kings are changing, and he's still rocking. You see that? Again, that's another sermon. So anyway, so now... Read, let's just read this and then I'll tell you the context of the story. Now, when Daniel learned that the decree 
there was a decree banning prayer, had been published, he went home to his upstairs room where the windows opened toward Jerusalem. Excuse me. Three times a day, he got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to his God, just as he had done before. All right, get this. So a few of the king's officials, they were jealous of Daniel. They didn't like Daniel because Daniel had a lot of favor. The hand of God was upon Daniel. So even while Daniel was in that captivity, he was thriving. He was doing well, much like Joseph. If you remember the story of Joseph, even when he was a slave, he was being promoted and promoted. So by the end, he was running all of Egypt. Because he was faithful to God and God's hand was upon him because he chose not to bow. Amen. So same situation with Daniel. So these guys were jealous of Daniel. So they tried to set him up because guess what? The king actually liked Daniel. Loved Daniel. You got to follow this because this is, this is very interesting. The king had a lot of love for Daniel. But these dudes on the side, they were jealous. They was hating. They was hating, right? They was mad. You understand? And so they said, what could we do? What could we do? And this is beautiful. Again, is is a... All right, anyway. So they said, what can we do? They said, what about, how can we catch Daniel? How can we catch Daniel and get him in trouble? Let's look at him. Let's watch his life. And what did they see? He's a praying man. Lord, have mercy. Let that be what people see when they look at me and they want to catch me for something. Let them say, man, Rand is a praying man. Say, she is a praying woman. So that, that's all they had. Man, we don't know. But we do know that he prays off the hook. And he's faithful to his God. So they said to the king, they went to the king, they said, hey. And they, they basically, you know, kind of tricked the king to make this decree. They, they played into the king's ego, into his pride. And next week we're going to talk about pride. Okay? But they played into his ego and they said, hey, king, how about we pass a, a law that prohibits people from praying to anyone or anything but you for 30 days? So the king was like, that sounds kind of cool, right? You know what I mean? Like he didn't peep what was happening, but he was just his pride, his ego was like, all right, great. I'm king. Cool. Everybody pray to me. 30 days. Nobody else. It's done. So they were like, yes, we got Daniel. Why? Because they knew that even with the law, this is, listen, they knew that even with the law being passed by the king, that Daniel would not cease to pray and would subsequently be arrested for breaking the law, but disobeying the decree of the king. Now, again, that's another sermon, but look at the beauty in that. They trying to trip up Daniel, and all they can do is, 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 is try and get him for being so faithful. That's what they can do. That's the, that's the dirt they got on him, that he's faithful. So faithful that even when the law passes, we know that he's still going to pray. And as we see here, it says that, he got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to his God, just as he had done before. Just as he had done before. When the decree came and said, all right, everybody, there's no praying to anybody but the king for 30 days. Daniel said, okay, excellent. Went on home and began to pray, just as he did the day before. Amen? And so what happened as a result of that? I'm sure you guys know it's a very popular story in the Bible. What happened as a result of him defying the king? He was tossed into a lion's den. The king was sad. He didn't want to do it. He was like, no, nah, don't tell me that's Daniel. No, that's my man. But the law is passed. And they told him, king, you passed the law. You can't go back on that. If you go back on that, the whole kingdom is going to look at you and they're not going to respect your other laws. So he said, all right. Feed him to the lions. Feed him to the lions. Okay? And the king said to Daniel when they threw him in the lion's den, because the king, he had a little bit of faith. He loved Daniel and he knew Daniel was a man of God and he just had a little bit of faith. He said, so the king gave the order and they brought Daniel and threw him into the lion's den. The king said to Daniel, may your God whom you serve continually rescue you. <laughs> Woo! He had a little bit of faith in him. He's about to preach a sermon. He said, man, he said, you, you know, Amen. He said, may your God who you continue, who you, I, I put that in bold there, who you continually serve, because that was the pattern. That was what they knew of Daniel, that he continually served God, that he resolved in his heart not to be defiled, that he made up his mind, that he was determined. And I'm preaching this sermon because I would love for us to be that same way. 
Amen. Amen. To make up our minds, to be determined, to be resolved, not to defile ourselves, but to defy anything and anyone that is in opposition to our God and our faith. Amen. Amen. And trust. No, I'm not going to get in myself. All right. <laughs> that's, that's coming up. So we talk. All right. So you and I also face persecution for our faith and the pressure to conform. And if we don't, that's a red flag. Say it again. I say you and I. We face persecution for our faith and the pressure to conform. But if we're not, that's a red flag. Because I talked about it earlier. Because if we're blending in, there ain't no persecution. There ain't no, there ain't no pressure to conform. We don't need to change because we're just like everyone else. Right? And Jesus, not Randy, not Pastor, Jesus said, if the world hates you, Keep in mind that it hated me first. Jesus. He said, if you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world. But I have chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. Strong words. That's what Jesus said. That's why sometimes when I'm rapping on a train and everybody's smiling, I get a little worried. <laughs> I get a little concerned. I said, folks look too happy. They just enjoy themselves way too much right now. You know? I said, I don't know. God, keep me. You know, so we have our own King Nebuchadnezzar and our own King Darius to face in our lives every day. You know? Today, the church is under great political, social, academic, religious pressure to conform. To feast on the pride of life, the lust of the eyes and the flesh. To bow to obnoxious statues, systems and structures and to retire our sacred devotions to God. Just as these, these brothers were. We're under that same pressure as a church and as individuals, right? Um, so will we defy or be defiled? Will we defy or be defiled? So there are would-be kings and powers in our lives, even in our own hearts, that wish to rule over us. Did you hear me? Yeah. There are would-be kings, could-be kings if we allow them to be king, in our own hearts. Powers and pressures that would love to rule over us. Powers that we too must defy, adamantly defy, as Daniel did. Otherwise be defiled. There's a whole bunch of kings or would-be kings. I don't know if you heard of these, these, these people. There's King Jealousy. There's King Bitterness. There's King Selfishness. They got kingdoms, too. They got whole kingdoms. And they would love for you to be a part of their kingdom. King Lust. King Addiction. King Gossip. King Work. King Money. King Materialism. King Legalism. King Relativism. King indifference, king fear, king doubt, king ambition, king security, king vanity, king religion, king culture, would be kings and could be kings if we allow them to be kings in our hearts. If we allow them to occupy the space in our heart that only God deserves, then they become our own Nebuchadnezzar, our own King Darius, our own gold statue, our own decree banning, prohibiting us from praying to our God, but instead praying to this other thing or this other person, right? And Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6, verse 24, no one can serve two masters because either he will hate one and love the other or be loyal to one and despise the other. So Jesus is saying, you can't serve me and Nebuchadnezzar. And Daniel and them knew that. You can't serve me and King Darius. You can't serve me and obey that law that was just passed. Okay? And for us today, the list is very long. Again, of would-be kings, could-be kings and masters. That Jesus is saying, hey, you're going to have to choose between the two because you cannot serve me. And that. Okay? So we have to choose to be, uh, to defy or be defiled. So now the question is this. How? Right? How? Because as I said earlier during worship, you know, in those moments when we feel like we don't need God, that's when we need God the most. So if we're thinking right now, yeah, defy, defy, I got this. 
you're in trouble. Okay? Because if you're standing in front of King Nebuchadnezzar and there's a flaming furnace to your left hand side, you do not have the power within yourself to defy the king. Okay? But we're going to talk about this. The problem is, as I just said, in many cases, we, we rely on willpower instead of real power. Okay? We rely on willpower instead of real power. So we say, I can do this. I can beat this. I can abstain from that. Whatever it may be. But what happens is it may be a season, like a New Year's resolution. It may last for a little while, but eventually we give in. Eventually we bow. All right? Because Jesus said, apart from me, you can do no good thing unless you abide in me. Amen? So don't be fooled. Willpower is no match for Satan's sin and our own selfishness. Now, I'm not, I'm not down to willpower. Willpower is good. It can get you but so far. Amen? But that's why we sing. What do we sing about our wills? Being conformed. Did we not just sing that? Is that the right lyric? To conform even our willpower, even our will, let it be conformed to the things of God. Let it be informed by the things of God. Let it be fueled by the things of God. Let it be empowered by God. Amen? Amen. All right, so we in and of ourselves are powerless, as were Daniel and his friends. But we can be, as they were, empowered by God. Instead, which is ultimately the only way to defy powers and pressures in this world. Excuse me. All right. So here's how Daniel and his friends found the courage to defy kings. Let's look at it. Next slide, please. All right. Defy, be defiled. Turn, trust, and tell. So I was looking at the patterns of these three stories and I found these three things. Turn, trust, and tell. Turn. Submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee. Okay, that's the turning part. They had to turn. When Nebuchadnezzar said, hey, you bow, we'll get to us in the front. They had to turn to a power that was higher than the power they were facing. You understand? Because they didn't have the power within themselves to resist. You understand? Obviously, because they were just tossed into the fire. If they had the power to resist, then they would have saved themselves, but they could not. So they turned to God, you know, submit to God, resist the devil, he will flee. But then they had to trust God. And here's what's very interesting. When they chose to defy the king, their salvation was not immediate. They were not saved on the spot. It was not, no, we're going with God, and then God rescued them and kept them. No, they got tossed into the fire. You know, it's like, that's what you don't want to happen. It's like, I'm standing with God. And they're like, all right, peace. And you're like, oh, snap, it just got real hot. <laughs> you understand? So their salvation wasn't immediate, so they had to have a trust factor. They had to have a trust factor to say, I'm going to defy the king. I'm going to turn to God, and then I'm going to trust God, you understand, to keep me, regardless of what goes down, regardless of what the consequences are, the repercussions of defying the king right now, I'm trusting God to keep me. And then finally tell, because we are living letters. The Bible says, you are a living, or you are a letter from Christ, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God. In other words, their lives now tell the story of the glory of God. You understand? Because they defied the king and God did an awesome thing. Now when people look at their lives, it's like reading the scriptures, like reading a letter. They see God in Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Let's go to the next uh, slide. Okay, so the first thing they did was they turned, submit to God. In the first story, remember, Daniel was, was offered this plate of food that would have defiled him. Remember that? Say amen and remember that. Amen. Okay, so, and what he do? He resolved, he made up his mind not to be defiled. Okay, now it says in Daniel 1, 9, check this out. This is an indicator of where the power came from. The power didn't come from Daniel. Because guess what? His superior could have said, you don't have any choice. This is from the king. And if we don't do this, the king could have my head as well as yours. You don't have a choice. You understand? That could easily happen. But here's how you know it was from God. It says that now God had caused the official to show favor and compassion to Daniel. God caused his superior, who was not even a believer in the one true living God, his superior, who was actually on the side of Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonian army, to now have favor and compassion for Daniel, who was defying the king. 
Only a God thing. That doesn't happen apart from God. It doesn't happen apart from God. Okay? And the second story, when they were facing uh, Nebuchadnezzar and they were supposed to bow to the gold statue, but they defied the king. Here's what happens after that. We read that. The God we serve is able to deliver us from it, and he will deliver us from your hand. In other words, they're um, communicating the source of their strength, courage, and defiance. They say, it's not me, king, but it's God. Okay? In other words, they're turning to God. In that moment, they're turning to God. They're turning from the statue, and they're turning to God, saying, hey, God is able to deliver me. Amen? And then finally, in the third story, when Daniel gets tossed into the lion's den, these, uh, then these men went as a group and found Daniel praying and asking God for help. So when the decree was passed prohibiting anyone to pray uh, to anyone but the king, they went and what did they find Daniel doing? Praying for help. Turning to God. Submitting to God in that moment. When the pressure came and the persecution came, he turned to God. And what the scripture says, submit to God. Resist the devil and he will flee. Amen? Let's go to the next slide. So they turned. And then they had to trust the process. This is maybe the most challenging part. They had to trust the process, okay? Here we see that deliverance and salvation were not immediate. First, they turned to God for the courage to defy the kings. Next, they had to trust the process. Family, we have to trust the process, okay? In this church, we have to trust the process. Somebody posted something the other day, I think it was Erica, about how Daniel, when he prayed for 21 days, nothing happened. He had to trust the process. He continued praying. And I've been in that season where I feel like, yeah, I don't even trust the process. Okay? They were thrown into the fire. Trust the process. Daniel was thrown to the lions. Trust the process. In the first story, uh, when Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the food, he said, test us for 10 days. So now again, there is a process. He said, come back and check on, on us in 10 days and see. So now he had to trust, God, you better do something here because they're going to come back in 10 days and determine my life, basically. And I'm turning to you and I'm trusting in you, God, because I can't do it, so you do it. You understand? So we have, they had to trust the process. Um, Daniel said in the first story, please test your service for 10 days. Give us nothing but vegetables to eat and water to drink. There's a process there. Um, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego when they were tossed in the fire. And these three men, firmly tied, fell into the blazing furnace. They were firmly tied and thrown into the fire. And then finally, a stone was brought and placed over the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own ring, uh, signet ring, and with the rings of his nobles, so that Daniel's situation might not be changed. In other words, they made extra effort and took extra care to make sure that it was over for these dudes. You understand? And they knew that. So they had to trust the process. Look at the next slide. Okay. And, 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 and in regards to trusting the process, the Bible says those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. Those who wait on the Lord. In other words, those who trust the process shall renew their strength. Mount up with wings as eagles. They shall walk and not grow weary. They shall run and not faint. And that's exactly what these guys were doing. They were trusting the process and they were being encouraged and empowered through that. Finally, they tell. Okay, look and see that God is good. Now, here's the, here's the, the end result of their defiance. And they're turning to God. Daniel 1.15. At the end of 10 days, they looked healthier and better nourished than any of the young men who ate the royal food. Amen. And guess what that was? That was a testimony. That was them testifying. That was them telling of the Lord's wonders and the Lord's goodness and the Lord's power. Amen. And it says that their officials said, okay, you win. You got it. You don't have to partake of this food anymore. They had special privileges. Amen. In the story with the um, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, it says... This is King Nebuchadnezzar talking now, right? Remember, they're thrown in the fire. They're in the fire. King Nebuchadnezzar says, look, I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound and unharmed. And the fourth looks like a son of the gods. He only messed up by one letter there. Take the S off. Look like the son of God. That's Jesus. Amen. Who was with them in the fire. Amen. Again, you see them telling. But they could have never told of God's glory unless they had defied the king in the first place. Sometimes we want to preach people to death. They ain't hearing it. 
But when they see Jesus in you, when they see the power of God, the glory of God in your life manifested in some real ways, like King Nebuchadnezzar, I see he is not alone. I see King is not alone. There's somebody else with them. And it looks like the Son of God. Amen. Let's go to the next slide. Amen, 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 amen. King Nebuchadnezzar, after he brings the guys out the fire, mind you, just, just, just a side note, the fire, he said to turn the fire up so high, you guys know what happened? They turned the fire up so high that the soldiers that brought Daniel and them to throw them in the fire, they died. Just trying to get them in the fire, they died. Yet Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego walked out unharmed. Unharmed. And then so King Nebuchadnezzar said, Praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and rescued his servants. Guess what? Here it is right here. Y'all ready? This title is called Defy. They trusted in him and defied the king's command. They defied the king's command and were willing to give up their lives rather than serve or worship any god except their own god. This is coming from Again, a polytheistic pagan Babylonian king who was persecuting people of faith. He's saying, I'm ready to testify now that God is good. That's how excited he got by seeing God do something awesome in this man's life. See, sometimes we're so afraid to stand up to people in situations. We're so afraid, not even knowing that if we stood up, man, they probably would respect us even more. And they would see the glory of God in our lives like, wow, see, they chose not to defile themselves. You know, a brother said that last night. He was like, yo, man, things are different here. When you're around people that's not sinning is what he said. He said, it feels different. Y'all feel funny to me. You understand? <laughs> he could see something. He could feel something. He could sense something in the house of God around the people of God. Amen. And that's what happened here with Nebuchadnezzar. He said, man, all right? Beautiful. So who or what is sitting on the throne of your heart? That's the question for us to ponder. Who or what is sitting on the throne of your heart? Who or what have you been desperately wishing to defy yet find yourself powerless against? Is there anything in your life that you feel powerless against? That you wish you could defy? But you falter and defile yourself time and time again. The purpose of this message is to tell you that you can be empowered by God to defy dethrone and defeat every would-be king, temptation, addiction, habit, weakness, propensity, and power keeping you from being who God created you to be. Amen, John? That's the purpose of this message. Amen? That you can be empowered by God to defy, dethrone, and defeat every would-be king, temptation, addiction, habit, propensity, weakness, keeping us from living to our full potential in Christ Jesus. Keeping us from being effective. In Matthew 28, verse 18, Jesus said, All authority, and you, you could, you could be going, and, and all authority, excuse me, in Matthew 28, 18, Jesus said, All authority, all power in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Okay? So remember that when you're facing Nebuchadnezzar, Darius, pressures, persecution. When you have to choose whether you're going to defy or be defiled. Remember that Jesus said all power on heaven, in heaven and on earth. All authority has been given to me. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you for your word this morning. And we pray that it would penetrate our hearts, God. That it would penetrate our, our hearts, God. And that it would bear fruit, Lord. That it would bear fruit in our lives, God. We pray that you would empower us. I pray that you would empower everyone in this room, God. By your spirit, the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead. That you would empower your people in this church to defy every would-be king, every temptation, every, every power, every pressure that we're facing today, God. And that as a result, that all would 
see that you are good, that you are great, that you are awesome, Lord. That you would get the glory, God. We thank you that you give grace to the humble. And that you humble the proud. And I pray that we would humble ourselves, God. That we would humble ourselves, God. That you would enable us to humble ourselves, God. And defy anything and everything that is in opposition to who you are, Lord. We thank you for the gospel, the good news, God. This is good news. The good news is that we're not alone, that we're not powerless, that we have you, God. And that in you, all things are possible. So I pray that we would leave here knowing the good news, God, of your son Jesus and the power that you have deposited in us because of it, Lord. And Father, I pray if there's anybody here right now who has not given their life to the Lord Jesus Christ, and what that simply means is saying, yes, I believe and I want to I learn more. I want to follow you, Jesus. I'm tired of, of defiling myself with the same old stuff over and over again. I'm tired of, of falling and giving in to the same old stuff over and over again. I need to be empowered. I need a power greater than my own willpower. And from what the, the scriptures say today, that's you, Jesus. That's you, God. And so, if, if you're in this room and you feel God is, is talking to you, and God is saying, come on home, I want to empower you, I want to strengthen you, I want to be with you when you're facing all these things, then I just want you to simply raise your hand so we can pray together. Just like everybody else in this room has at one point raised their hand or stood up to say, yes, Jesus, I, I, I submit to you. I see you. I see you. Thank you, Abba Father. Hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah, Lord. You are wonderful and worthy to be praised, God. We thank you, Abba Father. We thank you, Abba Father. Hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah. We're going to pray this prayer. And if anybody else want to raise their hand, I'm going to give you another opportunity to do so. But we're going to pray this prayer. We're going to submit to God. <laughs> and we're going to trust the process. And then we're going to tell of his greatness of what he's done in our lives. Amen. Hallelujah, Lord. Amen. Church, repeat after me. Let's pray this prayer together. Amen. Dear God. I believe. And I turn to you right now. I ask that you forgive me of my sin. And I ask that you would. Come and live inside of me. Empower me. I can't do this life alone. I don't want to do this life alone. I want to be with you. I believe. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. 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 And if you prayed that prayer for the first time today, I want you to get with another sister or somebody in here and build and, and, and figure out what some of the next steps are. Amen? Amen. Amen. Amen.